You're listening to Radio Eden, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in uh, to Radio Eden. Uh, we have now got uh, Trey Smith on the line. Um, the uh, The talk is via a Skype link up, and um, the quality may not be so good. So if you um, please bear with with us here on this uh, talk, and uh, um, try and uh, stay with us, even if the quality may not be as, as good as times. But we try. We will try our best here at Radio Eden. Uh, the talk is going to be on, on the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is mentioned in um, the Bible, in the book of Jude. Uh, Jude refers to the book of Enoch. And uh, in antiquity, or at the time of Christ, this, this book was quite known and uh, well-liked, and people knew about it. Uh, yet today, a lot of people, um, they may know about the reference, but they've never heard about it. So Trey will be talking about the book of Enoch, and uh, he has studied and researched this uh, a long time. So uh, we will we will uh, have a little bit of a discussion on the Book of Enoch. So I'm going to call him in one moment, and then uh, you will uh, be able to, to tune in and to listen to what he has to say. So stay tuned here at Ready Eden. Uh, we'll sort of try to stick it within the next hour. Uh, after the hour, we'll go back to our normal programming with the best of music uh, here at Radio Eden. Trey, um, welcome to Ready Eden, and it's a pleasure to have you to have you with us here. Book of Enoch. Tell me a little bit about it. I know you you've done a lot of studies in the Book of Enoch. Actually, I've read the Book of Enoch through only one short time, but I found it sort of quite intriguing, and there's a lot of intriguing aspects in it. So, uh, Trey, tell me more about it. What what do you think? Is it authentic? The the Book of Enoch is one of the most fascinating. Uh, books and topics that that, that, that I've studied, Michael. Why, why, uh, I mean, first of all, why is it relevant for Christians to, to at least know a little bit about the Book of Enoch? I think that the entirety of the Bible makes uh, a fabric. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Mm. Um, uh, folks will get very, very excited when they see in biblical texts, particularly people that, that, uh, that haven't really studied the text or they first get exposed to it. Mm. This is why you find people that research these texts, even if they begin as an atheist, mm. that they get excited about biblical texts because they'll see, uh, for example, in the book of Daniel, that it's, that it's laying out specific events that happen tit for tat for tit for tat for tit mm. for tat. But it's not just the prophecies. Like, for example, in Daniel, mm. where um, uh, <clears throat> Daniel is actually giving you the exact day and date, 600 years in advance before mm. Jesus would ride a donkey through that front gate in Jerusalem. He's telling you the rise and fall of empires that would come after his. Yeah, it's just like the Roman, the Babylonian Empire. I mean, obviously, Daniel was uh, at the time of the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire, but he, he also talks about the Roman and the Greek Empire, so that's that's quite interesting. Yeah, you, you couldn't get... In fact, people will... Uh, you know, some of the, the debunkers, if you will, would argue mm -hmm. against Daniel that it had to have been written after the fact. Because, because he was so precise, yeah. Mm. Yes, it's it's telling you not only the rise of Alexander the Great and his early death, but the splitting of the mm. empire of Alexander the Great under the four generals uh, that came after him and leading mm. all the way up to uh, Jesus Christ and then uh, on to, uh, uh, to Revelations. So, and when people get a touch of that, that that's, the, that's the fascinating thing, is that when people really come to the realization that what you're holding in your very fingertips mm. are words written during times where people did not have uh, iPads, they did not have printers, they could mm. not sit down on their laptop and type something. These words were written with great diligence and are thousands of years old and are tit for tat predicting events uh, <clears throat> which would happen I mean, that, years. there was one event um, about, uh, you mentioned this earlier <clears throat> when we were talking about the subject and I, I find it quite striking which, which I never really saw in that light there was an event where um, um, uh, the, the king of Babylon <clears throat> was about to be conquered by the Persians the Persians yes. came in and, um, and you mentioned I mean, you, you had basically this, this opportunity where Isaiah prophesied the whole thing 
even down to the name about the guy who would come in and who would, who would rule this 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 this, um, this district like Cyrus, and um, and that was quite an amazing feat in in, in many aspects. Trey, talk about that, this. That's one of the, yeah, what you're what you're pointing out mm-hmm. there. That and, and let me state this: that mm-hmm. is one of many many exa- I mean, the, the the book is littered with these, and you eventually mm-hmm. will come to the conclusion. Uh, at least the conclusion that I've come to, that, she, that, that every word is of significance, and mm-hmm. it makes not only specific prophecies that will land on specific dates with 100% accuracy, but the entirety mm-hmm. of the book creates a fabric, which is what's fascinating about Enoch, which we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get to in a minute, that I believe Enoch plays a role mm-hmm. in that fabric and, and plugs things in that might be... Uh, uh, it brings illumination to quite a few subjects. But on, on the issue of what you mentioned there, that is a fascinating story. When you're dealing with uh, Daniel, mm-hmm. who's in Babylon. Now, what had occurred there, uh, Michael, and for everyone listening, what had occurred is that uh, kings, when they would conquer an area, one of the common practices would be to go in and take some of the sun. So if you... If you were a king and you had conquered uh, an area, like in this case Israel, what you do is you take some of the uh, the ruling family's sons, right? You take some of the sons that are from the wealthy houses, mm-hmm. and you're not really taking them as slaves or you're planning to mistreat them. In fact, you're planning to treat them well and bring them up in your empire. But what this really is is it's, it's insurance against an uprising from that area that's now subject to you because you've got their firstborn sons. And so Daniel was one of these. He was, this is why Daniel was, he was Hebrew and he was raised up in Babylon, Mm -hmm. which was the, this was the most glorious of ours of Babylon that Daniel is there in the heart of it under one of the most well-known Kings. What, uh, what, yeah. what do we know from antiquity of what Babylon was like? I mean, you've read some stuff up on it. Like Alexander the Great, he you know, made some comments about Babylon. He, he, uh, it was, he, Alexander the Great, uh, coming from, uh, from Greece, when he, he conquered Babylon, there was, nothing, there was nothing he had seen on earth that was like it. Mm. Uh, we, we can't even fathom. I mean, artists do renderings of what it may have been like. But if, if you imagine an amalgamation of all of the most beautiful architecture from the ancient past, all consolidated into one precious gem on the desert floor, you would be looking at the empire of Babylon, nothing, nothing short of that. And that's where Daniel was standing in those hours. And the king of Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. You've actually got an entire chapter of the Bible, mm. written by a Babylonian king. I, I wouldn't be surprised, and don't, don't uh, quote me on this, but, uh, uh, but I would not be surprised if when, uh, uh, when you make it to heaven, there's a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar up there. Nebuchadnezzar fell totally in love with Daniel, and uh, with not in any kind of strange way. Daniel nursed Nebuchadnezzar mm. back to health, um, After you went crazy, some, yeah. yes, yes, mm. he had um, uh, uh, some kind of ailments that sounded extreme. They were mainly mainly mental. But Daniel was there and physically nursed this Babylonian king back to health. In the event that you were you were referring to mm. um, Nebuchadnezzar, ultimately he he died, and by this by this time Daniel is probably in his 60s, maybe his early 70s, but he's had an in, in illustrious uh, life history there in mm. Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar's, I can't remember if it was his uh, son or his grandson that took over, but it was Belshazzar, so mm. it was part of the family that had taken over the empire. Mm. And Belshazzar, what he decides he's going to do is he's going to throw a party mm-hmm. for a thousand of his princes. So this is no small, this is no small party that Belshazzar uh, is about to throw. Now, what Nebuchadnezzar had done, out of respect for the Hebrews, 
is he had collected, he had diligently protected and collected all of the items from the temple. Mm -hmm. So years earlier, before the Hebrews were in captivity, when they were even in, even in the desert and wandering around, they had all of these items of the temple that were very specific. These are gold cups and other things. Well, Belshazzar, he's going to pull this stuff out of basically the museum it's in, and he's going to use these things as party tricks. Mm. In, his, in, his, uh, in his party, he's throwing for his princes. Everybody's uh, getting drunk, and we're passing the women around and heckling and laughing and all of this. It's in that book of Daniel, right there in those pages, where we get one of the most famous lines that we even use today, the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. What it says in those texts is that while he's partying with the holy instruments uh, of God, which, which turns out that was a bad idea, an enormous hand comes out of thin air and literally scrawls some writing on the wall. What it states in those ancient texts mm -hmm. in the book of Daniel, it says that Belshazzar's knees smote one against the other, and his bowels were loosened. I don't know if you can get any more graphic than that <laughs> in an ancient text. And of course, everyone on the uh, everyone on the other side of the uh, uh, wherever you're listening from, I, I mean, you you know in your mind what this means. That okay, not, basically. I, his shorts were unclean at this point, and I don't point that out to be gross. This this actually plays a role in prophecy. It's specifically stated in the text for mm -hmm. a reason. Uh, um, okay, so, so prophets like yeah. Isaiah, they've prophesied this before about uh, the bouts being loosened. Basically, they need oh. a change of pants uh, dramatically, urgently. Yes, yes, it's going, yeah, it, this is, well, and it, this is just a portion of it. It's not in there by happenstance. Uh, but th So this is what's occurred. He's freaked out, his shorts, and everybody, and this is a public mm. thing. So in front of his princes, he has just completely embarrassed himself, and this hand has come out of the wall. Everybody's in chaos. Some, somehow, uh, they get everyone settled back down, and Belshazzar, he... He calls his mother in, and he says, uh, you know, he's asking her advice. Uh. And she says, well, under your, under your father, or under Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel was always who Nebuchadnezzar went to. Mm. He was the visor for Nebuchadnezzar. So Belshazzar summons Daniel in and, and, uh, and brings him in and says, and says to him, Daniel, I will give you... I'll cover you in gold. I'm going to put gold necklaces around your neck in abundance mm. to where you can barely walk with them. I'll cover your fingers with jewels, and I'll give you up the half of the kingdom. But I, I, I need you to decipher what's up here on this wall, what came on this wall. And Daniel looks him in the eyes and says to him in those pages, he says, you can keep your gold and your necklaces and your mm. rings, and you don't have half of an empire to give. And then he goes into a short dissertation in front of all of Belshazzar's friends and his princes and all of the people that were partying just minutes before, and basically what he states is your father, now there was a king, mm -hmm. but you, you punk, you're, you're nobody. But I, what I will do is I will translate what this says for you. And it says, you have been weighed and been found wanting. And that's another line that we use today. Even in, mm. in, in, in uh, uh, it's just a part of speech. You've been weighed and found wanting. So that's another, another one that comes right out of the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. <sighs> while they were having their party, while they were eating and drinking and doing all these things and having a good time, the Persians had literally lowered the water in the moats uh -huh. of the largest, most pristine empire on the face of the entire planet Earth. And we're coming in by stealth. Those moats were full of Persians that were crawling inside the empire while they were having their party. There were people days later that had no idea that Babylon had been conquered. Days mm. later. This is how stealthy this was, but they got a hold of the princes, and that would be 
Belshazzar's last day on the face of the planet Earth, indeed Daniel was right, Belshazzar did not have half a kingdom to give. Mm. Now this is critical because a number of days later, a number of days later, the king, Cyrus, is coming in to, uh, to Babylon with his grand procession, and it's actually mm. Daniel, from the book of Daniel, who walks down those stone steps coming down from the grandest temple on mm. earth and lays in King Cyrus's hand a copy of the book of Isaiah written 200 years in advance mm -hmm. during a different empire, not even Babylon. Isaiah lived under the Assyrians, and Isaiah predicted not only the fall of the Assyrians, but the rise of the Babylonians under which Daniel lived, and he predicted something else which was exactly the page that Daniel would lay out this scroll in front of Cyrus, and he would point to a section inside that 200-year-old dusty scroll that says, I, the Lord God, who call thee Cyrus by thy name, I have known thee, yet you have not known me. And you can look up that passage, and I promise you it's close to verbatim of what it says. It begins by starting with that man's name and goes on to say, I have lowered the, uh, who have lowered the moats of empires, right? And that's exactly how he made entrance. And then it says something else, and I have loosened the bowels of kings before thee. Now, <clears throat> In any other context, you wouldn't even make note of this. But mm. as a king coming into an empire, and he's entering a number of days later, right? And so what this what this was common knowledge. This was something that uh, Belshazzar would have known before he even entered. This this you know, or that Cyrus would have known before he even entered, is that this other king that you just conquered of the greatest empire on earth, he. Um, he kind of spoiled himself uh, I mean, embarrassingly. The, before you can imagine and, if that was a big party and there were, uh, you know, tons of nobles from Babylon at this party, that would have been the talk of the town. Everybody would have seen this. And apart from that, I mean, the writing on the wall, uh, I would imagine it's not being seen by Belshazzar, but by, um, by everybody. Yeah. Right, well, correct. So this is, uh, and here you've got an entire scroll, and then one more time in the text it will say, uh, um, uh, I, uh, the, uh, the Lord God, who call thee Cyrus by thy name, and to, encapsulating, literally encapsulating the prophecy of, of exactly, systematically stating out uh, the prophecy pertaining to King Cyrus, his name is mm. is stated specifically before and specifically afterwards it's mm. unheard of it, it would get if you were standing there in that hour and you were cyrus you would have a shiver holding that text mm. and his immediate response was to uh, uh to release the the hebrews who had been under captivity for exactly 70 years, years. Yeah before that night mm. and that was predicted exactly see Daniel knew that was coming but that was predicted exactly as well mm. and you could endlessly not run out of these and that's what I'm telling you is that uh, you, you could endlessly you could endlessly run out of the uh, you you could endlessly run out of these um, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I find the amazing thing about um, Cyrus that uh, he was a Persian king and uh, to me he was a bit like a, like sort of a hidden ally uh, to, to the Jewish cause and to the, the Israelite cause where suddenly they got all the protection they needed, they got all the freedom to try and rebuild Israel and rebuild the temple. And it's quite amazing, especially the 70-year exile produced uh, a bunch of people who were loyal and, and really committed to God and, and tried to rebuild a nation from a heap of rubble and to, to build back the Jewish nation. Well, the Cyrus, Cyrus plays a role because in, in, Daniel, in Daniel's text, the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple, mm -hmm. that's where Daniel's, the famous, uh, 
Uh, you've probably heard it said the, uh, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel. This mm-hmm. is a, a common a term, and what that means is these are 70 weeks of years. And he's predicting the exact date. So the start point of your 70 weeks of Daniel's famous 70 weeks start at the decree of Cyrus for the rebuilding of the temple. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, that's going to take you, so that's your, your marker, which is going to take you all the way to the very day mm. that uh, Jesus is going to ride uh, into the gate uh, of Jerusalem, and then shortly thereafter be rejected by the people. So he's given a grand entrance to the city of Jerusalem. And then just days afterwards, that they would actually be crucifying uh, their own Messiah. In the book of Enoch, in the book of Enoch is an eerie text. And that's where we started the conversation mm. was to, to, to head towards uh, the book of Enoch. And, and there are a number of things that, that in my mind give me a shiver when I read those texts. And I'll just lay those in your hands. Okay. Number one, if if Enoch is an accurate, authentic text, and let's bear in mind what this would be, what we're actually talking about here. This would be the seventh from Adam, the one in the Bible who it says, and Enoch was not, for God took him. So that's who we're talking about is the author of this document. This would be Noah's great, great, this would be Noah's great grandfather. So that, that document, if authentic, would be an actual text that is taken on that boat and survives this day. Now, in the, Enoch, in the uh, Ethiopian Bibles, the book of Enoch is a part of their canon. Mm-hmm. But, uh, of course, in the, you know, the King James Bible and the canons that most of all of Christianity save Ethiopia... Uh, does not recognize it mm-hmm. as um, uh, as a part of uh, a part of the canon. That text, more than probably more than any other, uh, is taking you through all of history in advance. It's taking you through uh, through the flood of Noah. That will, that will occur. It's taking you through the birth of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's taking you through the captivity mm-hmm. in Egypt. And it's taking you all the way to the promised land and the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's taking you. And that's why when a commentator or someone just like with the book of Daniel when a commentator looks at those pages, one would immediately say, there's no way this can be written except after the fact. Mm. Because it is that eerily tit for tat, and of course it's delivering you up all the way to the end, the return of, of Jesus Christ and uh, the Antichrist. Okay, um, quickly about the Book of Enoch. Um, you said, did I get this right, that the Ethiopians have got the Book of Enoch in their canon of uh, yes, all the scriptures? Okay, and I think the other big, which, which is quite important, the big claim to fame of the Book of Enoch is that it's, that you find a quote of it in, in Jude, yeah, which is in the New Testament. This, uh, it's certainly, um, uh, it's certainly a big, um, uh, leads a lot, lends a lot of credibility to Enoch. It is Jude would be Jesus's half brother, and uh, and Jude is quoting uh, verbatim out of, of the book of Enoch mm. um, in in one passage. There, I can't remember exactly. I think he's quoting Enoch one nine. Yes, and it's alluded to. Um, it's alluded to by Peter. So. Uh, it's believed that this was a text that not only the early church would have, would have had, but a text that also before Jesus would have been uh, many, many folks had. Yeah. And, and cop- fragments of that book of Enoch were also found 
uh, inside the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's no argument this is a document of, of antiquity. Okay. If, there, if there's an argument about the text, the argument would be uh, were things added to the text? The mm-hmm. argument would be, um, uh, well, that would be it. Not was there a Book of Enoch, but is what you're holding... Is it authentic, yeah, or not? not? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, Dead Sea Scrolls, just for, for our listeners, um, the, a lot of the stuff from the Dead Sea Scrolls was dated um, before, I think it was 200 AD, is this right? I, I believe that that's, that's roughly correct. That's what they believe that, uh, mm. uh, that it was. It's, it's certainly... Oh, sorry, uh, BC, uh, not AD. BC, before before, yes, before yes, Christ, not yeah, AD. That's, yeah. that's an important note. Yes, it was yeah. before Jesus. I mean, the, the big thing is they found the roads of Isaiah, and Isaiah has got very precise prophecies about uh, the life of Jesus, his death, and um, you know many events within the life of Jesus. And so the big argument is if uh, if we've got material which quotes you know which is dated well before you know 200 years before um, all the events happened with Christ then um, uh, it's just an amazing thing and it confirms a prophecy and the divinity of um, you know of the, the words of Isaiah but but then the other important thing is when you look at the Old Testament um, scriptures which have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and they are compared with what we have today they're de facto identical from, from what I've heard. And that's, that's sort of an amazing testimony of the accuracy of the Bible and the way it's being copied over generations. I think the Jews had a thing if um, every Hebrew letter's got a numerical value, if they copied a page, they, they added up the numerical value, and if it didn't match up with whatever value it was supposed to do, they, they would burn the page there and then because they knew they'd done a mistake somewhere. And... Um, And it's a bit like error checking today or parity checking today in computer uh, data transfer. You know, if the parity isn't right, you know, I've got an error somewhere and you have to discard the packet. So they did something similar. So it's quite amazing to, to see what's been inherited and, and the, the stuff we've got today. I find it interesting that Enoch was there as well, that the, uh, it was a, um, the Essenes, wasn't it, at the, the Dead Sea, the community which was there, that the Essenes would uh, read that stuff as well, that they had uh, Enoch. I mean, obviously, Jude was quoting it, so he knew about it, and it was known in, in those days. I, I, yeah, I believe it was the... Uh, but, um, the uh, Michael, the people uh, cared about these texts, mm. and that's why you're finding the, the accuracy. So w- when you're looking at a copy of Isaiah, for example, um, these people were extremely diligent with each mm. little word. And... Um, And what you're being delivered up is um, uh, was done with a lot of diligence, mm. requiring a lot of time. They they were not, and they they didn't have the tools that we have today, where you just you just manipulate stuff, or we're going to shuck and jive with the text. Okay. These were mm. those were critical texts, mm. and uh, were very. These were the most prized possessions of kings. Mm. And, and they wanted those texts to be accurate. And, and men would spend years putting together a, um, uh, make it, making, making single copies of some of these pages. Mm. In, in that book of Enoch, uh, the other reason that I believe it's authentic, it's taking you through a history that matches up with other cultures. It's talking about some things that are um, that are different than our day-to-day lives, than our mortgage payments and our car payments. Okay, let me, let me just interject a little bit. I mean, um, a lot of people, when they read the, the Old Testament, they read the Genesis account, and especially, you know, up to, to Genesis uh, 6, around about there, you get all these, these ages where people were living 700 years, 800 years, 900 years, And people think, oh, I don't believe this. This is impossible because we only live 100 years. Um, bef- before I let you comment on this, uh, which I think is quite interesting, it's quite important to sort of understand that life before the flood was sub- fundamentally different than after the flood, that things radically changed after this cosmic event which, which took place. But um, I, I sort of um, listened to some guys who were doing research into why people age and why people, you know, suddenly die. 
And, and one comment which really struck, struck me is, and, and, and one of the guys said, we think that this research is important because we cannot see any reason why, uh, you know, when cells renew themselves, why suddenly there should be this factor in there that they just renew themselves badly and, um, you know, put errors into the genetic code so that eventually we die and we age. And so there's no reason why, uh, why we couldn't live forever. That's what, what these guys said and, and why this, this aging kicks in. And I find this quite fascinating that, that really even today man is not being created with death in mind, but man is being created as um, almost like an, uh, somebody who could live forever, even in this body, because the way our cells replicate, there's no reason why they should suddenly die off and why suddenly this replication should go really badly wrong. And then we, you know, get old and die. But Trey, tell me about it. Tell me what you think, what's, what's happened. You've read the book several times and you've, you know it pretty well. Uh, what was life well, like me, before the flood? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, let's let's go uh, let's go on what you you mentioned there for just a second because mm. this is well, one of the most naive things we can do in this age is well, two things is to write off all of our our, our our ancient documents and there it's not just the Book of Genesis; it's giving you these long ages. The Sumerians are also giving you these long ages, but. But, but more than that, in, in our sciences that we have right now today, we, we've, we've been studying DNA for extensively studying it and really coming to understand how it works. Over the last 20 years, the increase in knowledge mm. that we know what we're dealing with is, it is programming code. If you took every single piece mm. of programming software that has ever been written from from day one of IBM computers to right now this very moment that you're listening to this show on the other side of your radio and consolidated all of that software into one, you would be light years away mm. from one strand of DNA. Now, in a human construct, you need literally trillions of these. You need software for every different type of mm. organ, right? And those are all those are all little. Um, uh, they're machines. Your your entire body is a biological machine with all sorts of biological mm. parts that function each other. And that software, that digital three dimensional software, more sophisticated in each piece then every piece of software ever written by mankind is what's running the show. It is what's pulling together all of the parts of the body that mm. you call you. And the cells in that body, yes, it's true, Michael. By their design, your cells are designed to um, continually renew themselves. In fact, what I understand cancer is, is when, when the cells... Uh, don't understand they're supposed to die. That's one way that cancer forms. Your body is run on digital mm. code and it's got programming to keep renewing itself. So the question becomes, what triggers aging? What, 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 what triggers death? And no one at this point today that I, that I know of has the answer to that other than to say what you're dealing with in its simplest, simplest parts is highly sophisticated. Mm. So we're introducing into the equation a mindset that turns out not to be true in many, many, many areas of science that everything has been exactly the way it is right now today in the past. I mean, we've got other documents as well, like uh, Gilgamesh and others who, who talk about these old ages where kings were living for hundreds of years, not just... Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not just the Bible, but it's, it's other un documents from antiquity, uh, which, which confirm and they, they, they pretty much tell the same story. Um, and, and so it's like you say, you can't really discard it if you've got several witnesses totally independent of one another. Um, makes it hard to, to just sort of swipe it off the table and say, oh, it can't be true. Let's forget about it and see what, uh, what, we, what we think what happened in the past today and forget about the records from antiquity. I think it's extremely naive. I think the most naive decision any one of us can make is to write out because it's not just the Christian text. It is not just the amalgamation of 66 documents 
written by 40 authors, separated by mm. thousands of years, that all makes a precision fabric uh, that, that, you're, that we're talking about alleviating as historical records. But mm. see, those texts, just like the DNA strands, all fit together like a perfect glove to make your mm. body work. All of those ancient cultures, their accounts of history fit together, click, 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 like a perfect glove. Mm. The time frames match up, the people match up. What you're dealing with when you're looking at ancient history is you're looking at two different perspectives on things. You are looking mm. from one point of view in the Book of Enoch. Enoch is telling you that he believed that the 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 fallen angels, these fallen watchers, which is really where Enoch begins, um, that these were beings that were fallen. They were um, uh, that they were part of Lucifer's little group, mm -hmm. and that this is the reason that caused the flood. When you look at on the other end of the fence, if you're looking at the Sumerian text mm -hmm. or the Egyptian text, they're writing the identical thing. They're writing about winged creatures that came in and produced their own offspring, but they're describing these as their gods. Mm -hmm. So what you're dealing with is you are dealing with historical accounts that to any one of us, it, it, it's... Uh, uh, Weird, it doesn't mm -hmm. jive with our day-to-day -day sense of mm -hmm. reality. But yet there it is, staring you in the face by empires who built some of the largest structures, structures we could not reproduce today mm. with equipment that we've got. And the main thrust, I, I've looked at these texts pretty much my whole life, and I will tell you this, that the main thrust of what these ancient people are trying to express mm. are these very stories. So... Yes, again, in my opinion, to discount what they're saying because it doesn't make sense to us, um, I go the other direction. I try and, and, and find out what it is they were saying and if indeed that's truly what they were saying. Mm. And that is what, what they were telling you. In, in Egypt, they are telling you that um, uh, there's some very strange events occurred, including, um, uh, uh, you're talking about fallen angels coming in and mm. birthing their own children, and these became giants. And they're talking about this in every every ancient culture. Mm. <clears throat> it's, um, again, it's, it's, I find it really interesting. Um, I did, a few years ago, I studied a lot about anthropology, which basically looks at, um, you know, people um, in, in the early days, it was mostly missionaries, going to these little islands, somewhere in the Pacific or uh, somewhere, uh, you know, in the outbacks in Africa or really anywhere in the world, but they are mostly isolated uh, tribes. And what they did is they, I mean, if they were a missionary, the first thing they did is they studied the language of the tribe, they studied the culture, and then they, a few years down the line, once they, they, they understood everything, they tried to, to then present the gospel or the message of the gospel in a way which was relevant to the tribe. And there are a couple of things which I find very interesting when you when you go through what these these um, missionaries had to report. First of all, most of these tribes, you know, little Pacific islands or somewhere in, in the middle of Africa, in the middle of the bush, isolated through wilderness or somewhere uh, sort of in outer Siberia or, or wherever they went, yeah. Uh, most of these tribes who were totally isolated, they had a concept of the flood. So the story of the flood was almost universal. There wasn't uh, a tribe which didn't have the flood as part of the history. There was a guy like Noah. Yeah, everybody um, you know, had this concept. I mean, the names were different, but they, they had the concept. And then the, the other thing which always struck me is most tribes they had this idea of some sort of redemption and of some sort of Messiah who, you know, who had to come to try and bring about this redemption. And, um, and I find this quite fascinating that, that this understanding was there. So the missionaries, in, in very often, they didn't have a very hard time to present the gospel because all they do is they try to 
uh, adjust the biblical stories to whatever they believe already, and then they say, look, I'm, I'm here to tell you about this man who has come to bring about redemption and to, to reconcile you to God. And um, and again, for, for me, this is absolutely fascinating to, you know, to see. And, and, and just by the merit of the fact that all these different groups, which are, um, you know, not just in one area of the world, but they are all over the world who have been isolated. Uh, and, and again, I, I just mentioned Africa, Pacific Island, the Amazonas, yeah, the Amazons, when, uh, when they sort of got to these Indian tribes, some in the middle of the bush. Um, that th this was there. And then obviously you've got historical documents as well. You've got Gilgamesh, you've got the Sumerian, you know, uh, epic. Um, you've got similar concept in the Maharabhat. You have heard, of, you've studied the Indian stuff, the Hindi? I, I, I haven't, but it gives me a, it, you know, it gives me a shiver just to, uh, uh, just to hear you go through these things because it, it, um, uh, because you're right, Michael, and, and the, um, uh, and, uh, on the issue of the flood, there's, there's 270, the, the official count of flood stories is 277. Some people will argue that it's thousands. Uh, when you're dealing with that epic of Gilgamesh, um, you're now talking, when you're talking about the epic of Gilgamesh, these are 12 stone tablets. Mm. These are the oldest original piece of writing that it's believed we have on the face of the planet Earth. Th those 12 tablets put you at 2900 BC. And in that Sumerian king's list, what you're going to read is that, um, the, is that Gilgamesh was a king of a place called Uruk. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bitty, this is a little bitty settlement out there, only a few hundred miles from where the quote unquote boat that saved mankind was said to have landed. This is only a few hundred miles away, mm -hmm. and you can see pictures of Uruk online today. You can type it in and see it. This isn't so. When you say King of Uruk, it sounds grand. You're talking about King of a little bitty settlement out there between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the first kings following the global flood. And in his epic, he references that he's going to travel further up towards those mountains. And he's going to look for one of the sons of, uh, uh, of, of Noah and talk, and talk to them. And, and epic, the epic of Gilgamesh, those 12 tablets... Are, are actually something we should we should go through at length at some point but mm. it's sufficient to understand that in our earliest text the oldest piece of writing that we have on the face of planet earth not only is the language on that stone incredibly sophisticated but it's telling you about that global flood and it's putting you up face to face with that flood, you've got under from Gilgamesh's point of view. This just happened, man. This is only a few generations before he's in existence. And the same thing with those early dynasties of Egypt, which are only a few hundred miles away from that. All of the cultures, your first civilizations, what we call the the, the cradle of of of, uh, of civilization out there, where we see our first cultures come up in Mesopotamia. They're, they're following the fertile land that falls right down out of the Urartu Mountains. So in one direction, you've got your developments that are there between the Tigris and Euphrates. This would ultimately turn into the empire that we were talking about earlier, Babylon. So what they did is little cultures began to build. And then just a few hundred miles away from that, on the banks of the Nile River, they were also starting little bitty settlements that developed into empires. Your first pyramids, your first try at a pyramid, and we're not talking about the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza. We're talking of you, they, there was a lot of first tries at pyramids, like the uh, the Bent Pyramid, which were you know were small, and some of them some of them fell apart. Uh, but your first tries at pyramids wouldn't be until about roughly twenty six hundred to twenty five hundred BC. You're looking at the ins. Our, this is what I'm telling you. On the mm. other side of this uh, uh, radio show is that uh, our our history really sort of appears right out of the desert in three thousand BC. Mm. 
And all of those documents, all of them, save not one, are telling you that there had just been a global flood. Mm. That they are rebuilding the world. Then they're going on to tell you about things that are like uh, what you were just mentioning a second ago, Michael, that they have this understanding, no matter where they are in the world, that something has visited them with a, with a, uh, uh, a, in the case of the Egyptians, they believe that their god, that the inception of their gods began with Osiris. Mm-hmm. Osiris uh, was a physical man. So this, this is what they believe. We call this mythology today, but the Egyptians would have told you that this is what happened. That's important to know. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just writing the time stone. Uh, Osiris, apologies to our listeners. Uh, we are doing the talk via Skype and uh, sometimes the lines go down. Um, so we are uh, having this session halfway across the world between Germany and Texas at the moment. Uh, Trey, Osiris, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. I can. <clears throat> Osiris... Um he, he got uh, Osiris was a physical man that got in a fight with um, uh, something they called uh, Seth, mm-hmm. and um, and that's interesting when you do a study on the sons of Seth. But but nonetheless, Osiris lost this fight. He got chopped up into uh, into thirteen pieces, mm-hmm. according to the the, the the text. But they couldn't find one piece of Osiris. And that was the um, uh, the phallus, the, the, the penis of Osiris. One 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 story it got uh, thrown into the Nile and was eaten by an alligator, and another one I think it's a hippopotamus. But whatever the case, the the gist of the story and what's telling you is that this winged thing that they called Isis mm-hmm. uh, came in and she she puts this physical body of Osiris, or this beautiful being puts this physical body of Osiris back together. And Osiris is depicted at that point as he's green in all of the, uh, in all of the drawings. And Egyptologists will say, well, it, you know, represents rebirth Mm -hmm. or whatever, but what they appear to be saying in their text is that their, their belief was some kind of a, uh, a spiritual entity that they called Isis entered in and, and a dead body of a man named Osiris was uh, became a conduit for what they would call an underworld god mm. took a seat on the throne ruled for a brief time but long enough for Isis to make a god that they called Horus from the blood of Osiris. Mm. Now, I, I know all of that sounds uh, uh, complicated, but this is um, what is what Trey. What is you. what is the source for this? Is this a Gilgamesh account where you got this from? Uh, the story no, of Isis and Osiris. Uh, Os- Osiris. No, Osiris comes from Egypt. No, no. I mean and, the account. Uh, where does the account come from? Is it from the? Uh, the hieroglyphs or from uh, yes, Egyptology? Yes, this or? would be. Yeah, th- this would this would come from uh, the yeah this this would come from the, the Egypt's beliefs uh, concerning its own inception, and uh, so when you look at those the uh, the hieroglyphs, particularly uh, towards the uh, the earliest of the dynasties, uh, you're going to find a wealth of talk. This was their main. Uh, belief was in Osiris. Every pharaoh was was they would do a uh, an invocation ceremony for every pharaoh, so that the same spirit that had dwelled in the dead body mm. of Osiris and had had caused him to live would dwell in the in the body of Pharaoh, thereby allowing the underworld god. The spiritual entity. This is what they believe that the underworld god 
to rule through the flesh and body of Pharaoh on the empires of Earth. And, and, and so every dynasty, this is what they would do. They would do the invocation ceremony mm -hmm. to, in, to invite in that, uh, uh, that spirit. And this would, in their, in their belief system, uh, gain them some, uh, 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 it would help them out when they entered the underworld. Mm. Their belief of the afterlife was, and where all of their gods come from, whether it's Horus that's represented as the solar disk that's in the sky, or whether it be Isis, which is the winged thing that's really pretty, mm. or whether it's the spirit that inhabits the Pharaoh himself, all of these things come from the same place, according to the Egyptians, and that's the underworld. Mm -hmm. And when they're drawing the underworld, it's a place full of serpents and flames. It's, it's a place where the common man is devoured. And the Pharaoh's hope is that he can serve the underworld gods enough that uh, when he enters the underworld, it, it won't be so bad for him. So you could use the word underworld, you could use the word shield, you could use the word TARDIS, or you could use the word hell. I would argue that they're all talking about the same place. By the way, it was very, very real to them. You find this in a lot of religions when you look into Hinduism as well. It's, I, I think it's very close that it's, it's all about appeasing gods. Yeah? And when you look at what these gods are, they're not very pleasant. There's, they're not necessarily gods of love. They're, they might be gods of pleasure, but they are like Shiva and others. They're just uh, horrible creatures who all they want to do is just destroy man. And what you need to do is just appease them by giving them little offerings, this or another thing to, you know, to have a good outcome for your life and, and uh, for whatever Hinduism stands for, for your karma in, in this instance. But um, I find it very interesting that, um, that whatever the Egyptians believed, it's like a lot of, it's like a religion which has been filtered into a lot of other stuff as well. I mean, even um, when you look at some, some Christian variants, uh, I may be able to say this because I was raised as a Catholic, I'm not one now. I've, I've left the church and I've abandoned it uh, to uh, the grief of my family. But, <clears throat> but what I felt was very similar, that there, there was always this leverage, you know. There's this, this reality of hell, and this is what controls you. Somehow you need to... Um, you know, do some stuff to, to try and get away from it. And in this instance, this was just used as a, as a means to manipulate you or, or control you, in, in a sense. And I find it's, it sounds very similar to the Egyptian cult, that uh, in this instance, what you're not doing, you're not um, trying to appease um, the God of heaven and earth, the good guy, the good God, to, to, to not get into hell, but it's basically a resignation. We're probably going to end up in hell anyway. So we need to make a deal with these guys so that it's not too bad with us. Is, is this how you would describe it, huh? That's you know what? That's probably the best summary I've ever heard, Michael. <laughs> the uh, that that's that's brass taxing it out. Um, and uh, and in Enoch, you're taking a walk through hell. And in Enoch's belief, you not only have these winged things that you're seeing in Gilgamesh, that you're seeing in all over Samaria, that you're seeing all over Egypt. But he's telling you that prior to the flood, this was the problem, that you had these spiritual entities that came in, and they made sort of a muddle out of mankind. They somehow birthed their own offspring. That's what he's telling you. So these things are neither angel, nor are they really human. Mm. And he's going on to express to you that when these things die, they become the okay. disembodied spirits, if you will. Uh, Pray, perhaps was... the very <clears throat> thing that... We've, yeah. we've got about uh, five minutes left. Uh, let's let's make okay. this, uh, you know, for our listeners as well. Next Saturday, tune in. We've got another talk on this. And uh, maybe let's let's focus on the Nephilim, you know, these, these giants and these hybrids who are half angelic, half human. And uh, the Bible talks about them. It calls them the heroes of old, you know, the, the mighty men of old. And... Uh, actually, I should pick up my Bible and just have a look at Genesis 6 and look at the exact expression. But, <clears throat> but I find it very interesting that um, there's, there, there's this little reference in Genesis uh, chapter 6 
And that's all, you know, it just stops there. And then the Bible just moves on with the story of Noah. And you've got like these, uh, I don't know, it's about two or three verses which, which talk about this. But yet when you look into the book of Enoch, um, there, there are like pages about this, this scenario where it just describes what was going on and what was happening in those days, uh, you know, with these Nephilim, you know, the, I think if you translate them, the fallen ones or the giants, you know. And, uh, well, we'll, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll go step, we'll go step by step through that next week. And it's not just a couple of references here and there. It is all over the place. It, it, mm. the, 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 the giants are, are through, uh, Deuteronomy, through Joshua. Mm. That's what they're quashing out when they're sending the spies in and they're saying, uh, we're like grasshoppers before them. Or the king of Og, whose uh, funerary bed was 14 feet 4 inches. Or you're reading from um, uh, specifically, the uh, most definitely, the book of Enoch. Or if you if you look at any of the, dr- the depictions of these mm. kings, and we also live in an age where we found bone structures that are unusually... Uh, large, unusual in a, in a, in a, in a mm. grand variety of ways, but we've certainly found anomalies um, that, uh, well, you've got eight and nine foot skeletons. Your tallest basketball players are what, like seven two, mm. and these are these are from a thousand years ago. So the the, uh, uh, the talk about giants is more than worthy of consideration. It is. Um, uh, there is significant reason to believe that uh, that a variety of extremely unusual mm. things have happened on Earth, and there's evidence for them all over the place. Okay, okay. Uh, so <clears throat> Try let me let me just we need to wind down, otherwise we we'll, uh, run out of time here. Um, okay, listeners, uh, tune in next week, uh, same time, same place, and you'll hear more about the Nephilim. Um, and you'll hear more about sort of books in antiquity. One thing uh, which I haven't done, but I will do, so please check out the website when you're hearing this, www.readyeden.com, is um, to, to put up the book of Enoch for you to download from the website. So feel free to just uh, go to www.readyeden.com. And uh, we're going to put up two books. Uh, one, of, one is a King James Bible, which isn't on there now, but it will be on shortly. And the other one is... Uh, the Book of Enoch as well, English translation, so you can download it as a PDF file, check it out, and and uh, see what you think about it. Um, Trey, uh, final comments before I pull the plug and uh, we are we are off air. The purpose of that entire uh, that entire Bible, every single page, every yacht and tittle, and even that Book of Enoch is Jesus Christ, and. Uh, uh, and I, I believe that, and I thank you for your time and listening mm-hmm. to the show, and I thank you, Michael, for the interview, and I look forward to next week and going through uh, the giants in antiquity, the Nephilim and even the evil spirits that yeah. Nick was talking yeah. about, maybe even a touch on the journey through hell itself. Yeah, that that would be interesting. Um, I mean, Enoch writes quite a lot about it, and, and bearing in mind, Jesus talked more about hell, and when you look through the uh, New Testament, the word hell is more mentioned than the word heaven. Um, so we cannot ignore it, and I think one thing which has happened in Christianity over the last, uh, don't know, 20, 30 years is that uh, hell is just being ignored, like it doesn't exist. You know? But it's a reality, and it, I think that's something we need to look at. Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, I have to uh, pull the plug. So next week, uh, quickly, a bit of information. You can uh, get more from Trey, also about the Book of Enoch, on um, your website. Trey, tell us your website. Uh, simply go over to godinanutshell.com and mm-hmm. um, uh, and you'll find a variety of things going on there at, at any given time, as well as a video on either. Okay, and um, YouTube as well, just type in Trey Smith and uh, God in a Nutshell, and you should you should find your, your website straight away, shouldn't you, or your films? You've got quite a few. How many films have you got on there? It's, there's, uh, well, there's 22, there's 22 videos okay. on there, mm-hmm. maybe there's a few more than that, but there, there's a bunch, and uh, on a variety of topics, and uh, and it's all it's all right there for you, godinanutshell.com, whether on YouTube or whether okay. just right on the internet. 
Okay, um, the same as well, if you want to check out this talk, it'll be on uh, www.radioeden.tv. Uh, again, it, it redirects you to your YouTube channel and you can just uh, tune in and, and listen to this talk again if you want to you know, check it out or go through it one more time. Okay, um, that leaves me to say uh, goodbye to, to you, Trey, and to our listeners, uh, tune in www.radioeden.com and then www.godinanutshell.com. Is this right, Trey? This is correct. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.